here. Apparently, there's a line going all the way out around the corner as well. So great to see fashion being um, so, so popular in a, a technology summit. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be on stage with these three individuals. All of them are experts in commerce in their own right, and all of them able to share incredible insights on subjects including entrepreneurship, branding, and community. And in fact, when I was researching this panel, I did find that community was the one word that really seemed to unite the three of them together, because otherwise they are actually all very, very different. So I think to start, maybe just in case you don't know who they are, it might be really useful to hear a little bit from each of you about what it is that you, that you do and what your company is. Christoph, do you want to give us a start? Um, yeah, my name is Christoph. Um, I'm working at Zalando. I joined Zalando seven years ago when the company was founded. We are now the Europe's biggest fashion retailer, just uh, made in last year more than two billion. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my goal currently is to build products for brands to directly engage with customers on the Zalando platform. Hi, I'm Anne Breathton and I'm the founder of My Flash Trash, a charm jewelry company. I started it back as a blog when I was a teenager and we scaled it into a marketplace for up and coming jewelry and accessories designers before pivoting into charm jewelry in January this year. And I'm Runa Reiser, I'm the CEO of Depop. Depop is a social network for buying and selling. Our users call it Instagram with a buy button or eBay for millennials. And um, it's a place where anyone can join, anyone can sell, uh, and people then gather around the, the sellers that they like. They follow them, they comment on their stuff, um, and they can eventually buy stuff. Great, and I'm Rachel, I'm a freelance journalist writing largely about fashion technology, so I've been covering these three guys for years, so it's really exciting to actually have you all in one place. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think community really seems to be that thread that ties you all together. And I think that's you know, one of the strongest points if we're talking about branding lessons for the fashion industry. After all, if you don't have fans um, that love you and keep coming back, you know, there's not a huge amount of hope for success in this industry. So Amber, let's turn to you first. Um, My Flash Trash is obviously now VC backed. You're worth five million, if I'm correct. And I believe one of the main reasons for that is probably because you have such an incredibly loyal fan base. So can you tell me a little bit about how you go about harnessing that community? Yeah, so we used to rely heavily on magazine placement and celebrity endorsement to drive traffic and conversions. But then something interesting happened. We had um, two of the girlfriends of One Direction bought some jewelry from us, and it just blew up in the fangirl community online. And what was so interesting was the longevity of that as a traffic source and a conversion source for us. So got to thinking, okay, how can we emulate the sort of fangirl communities that brands have. So we started recruiting social media ambassadors to be in our charm gang. So we now- Do you have groupies? We have a little groupie thing going on, yeah. So um, we use the space in the bio on social media, in Twitter and Instagram, for girls in our target range, 14 to 24, to link back to my flash trash. So we now have, we started it about two months ago, we've got 350 girls in our charm gang now. And they act not only as our content creators, distributors, a marketing channel, but also as our customer service and really as a customer acquisition tool. Because it's a really honest, authentic community and they feel a part of it. And I think millennials want that experience. And on average, they buy twice a month from us, so the retention rate of it as a program is fantastic. So you're actually talking about loyalty there in that they are, your, I presume, your biggest customers as well as your advocates. Yeah, and my main, my main focus, definitely. Rina, for, for you, I think what I find interesting is that you're curating a, a community yourself in many ways, but you're also helping others curate their own too. Can you, can you explain a little bit about, about what you mean on that mm. front? Yeah, so Depop is an open platform, and it's open for any kind of community. It started out very much with the stylists in Milan, believe it or not. That's where it initially was seeded. So it took on a fashion spin very early on. And then from that fashion spin, it spun into other lifestyle categories. And now uh, different groups of music artists are using it to connect to their fans and also to make some extra money. It's a, it's a, it's a tough world out there for emerging talent, and anyone that has the authenticity as an individual or as, an, as a small brand can now also start monetizing on that 
via different platforms, right? It's so easy now for anyone to set up a shop and become a brand. And uh, the whole thing that you had to worry about in the past with, okay, how do I get paid? How do I get customers? How do I do this and this and that? I don't know anything about technology. That's all gone away, right? It's now with, with a mobile phone, anyone can take super professional photos, upload them in less than 60 seconds, and with tools such as Depop, and there are some others as well, where all of a sudden you have a shop and you start curating your shop just like you would do if you had a shop on a, on a high street. So we've seen people graduating from, I have a big social media following because I am an authentic, relevant person, to I'm now Depop famous, to I'm opening a shop. So we have Depop users opening shops in cities around UK and the US now because they built the, the initial following on a social media-like platform. How many, I mean, you said that you are, I know you don't always love these references, but eBay for millennials or Instagram with a buy button. No, and I love, think the, the nice thing about that is obviously <coughs> it makes it very clear very quickly kind of what the aim of the platform is and what you're able to achieve. Can you talk a little bit to the millennials? I mean, I presume that is your main uh, user base. Yeah, like, like any other network out there, it, new social networks don't get started by 45-year-olds. <laughs> we might be building them, but the people who are deciding what's the, what's the next big social network are always the 16 to 18-year-olds. Um, so so we, we started very much with an older audience, but then we saw the younger audience coming on board, and what they do is they, they don't accept rules. So we, we had certain intentions for how to how to behave and how to sell on Depop, and they break those rules. So they start posting things that are not a product. They'll post a picture of the beach saying, I'm on holiday, my shop is closed for a week. And that kind of thing, it, it, it turns out, is the way that you build a social media brand. And I'm sure Amber knows this much better than I do, that we have so many people that are so good at this brand building from the ground up. And, and it's my hope that in the future, just like we see now SoundCloud and YouTube becoming the, the base of new talent within film and music industry, that platforms such as Depop could be the base of new talent in, in the fashion industry. So you think that you know, some of the things that you're seeing on there are new brands, it's people selling their own product and not just a, a marketplace for, for, other, for other goods, for used goods as such? It very much started out as a, as a marketplace for vintage goods and, and our curation can also help informed that and in, in the beginning we curated very much vintage goods. But then as we saw people coming on board and becoming more serious about the platform, there was demands of, hey, can I sell multiple quantities? Can I sell a t-shirt collection that I've done in these different sizes and these different colors? So we've, we've listened to that customer feedback and now you can do that and, and, and with that involvement, now Depop is becoming a platform for new brands to, to emerge. And we have some, some really big ones now that started very, very small. We also have some people that were big outside of the platform trying to come into the platform. But I, I think it's really interesting when you see people working their way up, either through social media or, or through a, a platform like this. Amber? Hello. Oh. Um, yeah, I think if you're launching a millennial brand as well, we use Depop for a subline, and it's fantastic to get the traction with that because you have a millennial customer base. So it's a really frictionless user experience to upload it and to buy it. So yeah. you can pay me later for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very nice segue actually to, ta to talk B two B with Zalando. But uh, first, Christoph, I, I wanted to. To speak a little bit about your version of community, you're obviously a market leader in Europe, which means your community is very, very vast. Um, and, and one of the things I love about you guys, I've, I've read a lot about this, and obviously your co-founder spoke about it on the stage yesterday, is the localization aspect. Um, and I presume, you know, that's, well, first of all, it's very fascinating. It's obviously very necessary to do that when you are so vast to kind of really suit local needs. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and kind of the differences you're seeing across Europe particularly? Yeah, so... 
for example, when we when we launched in, in Italy three years ago, so you see different uh, e-commerce waves all across Europe, and um, Italy is not such a mature market, for example, as in, in terms of e-commerce as uh, the UK. And when um, we launched there, we we focus on on several KPIs, of course, and one is the, the contact ratio, where we see okay, on how many customer orders do we get, how many customer calls, and. Uh, for example, in, in, in a very mature market, like also like Germany, we have uh, something like around 10%, so 10 customer orders um, and one customer call. Um, when we launched in Italy, we had a, a contact ratio of 200%, so 20 customer calls per 10, um, 10 orders. And uh, the single most asked question was, do you really exist? So customers were just calling in order to make sure if, uh, if the company on the other end and on the website really is a real company. I don't know where that does uh, come from, but in the end uh, it shows that there are, that there are huge differences. Um, another example would also be in terms of how do you advertising. Um, when we, I mean, we were very popular with some, uh, let's say, very brand awareness driving TV spots uh, across Europe, especially in Germany. Was, um, we had one spot where we um, had showed um, yeah, uh, a delivery, a postman coming into a nudist camp and delivering um, yeah, parcels to, to women who, was, who were ordering out of this, this nudist camp. It was very funny and raised a lot of awareness and was very popular in Germany. In, in the Netherlands, which uh, might have the cliche of being a, a camper country, a camper people. Um, we got in the same year when we also uh, uh, aired the, the same TV spot over there, we got the, um, the award for the worst TV spot ever in that year. Um, so we had to learn, okay, we can't use the, the, same, um, the same advertising. And uh, two years later, um, we, we did a completely different campaign in, in 2013 in, in the Netherlands and um, tested um, using testimonials in the TV spot. So we used uh, um, a Dutch celebrity, and, uh, and, and that year we won the award for the best TV commercial. So in, in two years, we got from the worst to the best TV spot, and I think that shows how, how different the markets are and that you really have to adapt and uh, have to pay attention on, on the local on the local needs and on the local industry. I love that one about customer service. That's amazing. <laughs> Some cynicism out there. <laughs> yeah. And you see it also, um, and, and for example, in Poland was quite, quite similar as well. So we had, uh, we, we, we've seen uh, stuff like that. So when, when, when we launched then in two countries, we, we took that into account. And um, yeah, maybe another example also from, from Switzerland, where we learned, for example, that the, um, the, the way how customers pay in Switzerland is always at the end of the month. So um, what, what we usually did was send out maybe some reminders, okay, you have to pay your, your bills um, in the beginning or mid of the month, but they, it, it never worked. They only would pay at the end of the month, so we had to adapt our processes. And um, yeah, now we, we're working in a different way country by country while we initially started to say, okay, we, we do it, maybe we, we just take the synergies and do it uh, all over the, the place in the same way, but we have to adapt in the end, and that's, that's what, we, what we learned. Amazing. So um, what you guys may not know is Christoph was, I believe, the third employer, employee sorry, yeah. at Zalando. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you've moved more recently over the last, what, 18 months into more of a B2B position. Can you explain a little bit what about that means? I mean, I presume a lot of people in the audience probably see Zalando as straight e-commerce, but, but tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, on the platform behind the scenes otherwise. Yeah, so when, yeah, when I joined Zalando uh, seven years ago, we were pretty much focusing for, I would say, five to six years on building the best cu customer experience and building the, the process around that and the tools and, and the products to really serve the best customer need. But um, 18 months ago, we, we kind of started to think about, okay, how can we actually build a platform and involve also the other parties we're working with, like the brands and then retailers we work with. Um, so, um, yeah, I started to build up a, a product area where it's about building um, tools and services around the needs for the brands we work with. So we enable them with very lightweight tools and in a very similar way, like, like Runa said, to, to step out as Zalando in a way and let the brands directly engage with their customers, build their own brand appearance, build their own brand shop. And um, we believe that as a retailer, you can create you can do a lot of, of curation in the shop itself, but if it comes to a brand, and that's actually why the customers are at Zalando to, to shop a, uh, a certain brand, um, the brand can do much better every single brand individually for their own purpose. And that's, that's what we're now enabling and giving them the best tools um, to provide a very easy way. And also, in, in our terms, it's also we have to do it again for the international um, um, audience as well. So to build a very lightweight tool where the brands can easily set up their brand appearance all across Europe um, without having the hassle of, um, of adapting them to the local needs, but really make it as easy as possible. So that's the goal we have here and step out as Zalando and really bringing the customer and the brand together. 
And what, I mean, for you and for Runa as well, I suppose, for you also, what, what challenges are you finding that brands are, are facing when they come to your platform in terms of, for you, I mean, I presume it's quite a logistical operational perspective. For you, maybe it's more to do with kind of fitting in with who your customer and the community is. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I think the, the brands that are social media savvy, they get it immediately. Whereas the brands that are used to saying, well, here's our product line, now let's push it through our normal marketing channels, they, they always struggle when they see like this, and say, how do we find the customers? Uh, whereas the, the millennials and the, and the fashion bloggers that come on, they immediately get it, and they immediately start just building a following like, like you do. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting to see how the power of traditional advertising is, is decreasing day by day, and the power of authentic engagement is increasing day by day. Um, and back, back to uh, your point about the Italian, the Italian user base, for us as well, the Italian user base is super engaged, and that means that they will send more messages to the seller <laughs> per sale, and that's actually a good thing, because the more messages you send back and forth to the seller, and this is, this is chat, this is not email, and chat is, is like having a conversation. If you have a conversation with your customer, that is a relation being built. And that relation is going to give you recurring sales, it's going to give you worth of mouth. So the people that are putting a lot of, of personal effort into e-commerce of the future are going to be the winners. So I, I've sometimes said that the, the social media manager is your, is your store manager on social media. That's nice. People, people are hiring a lot of people to stand on, on empty store floors, but then when it comes to hiring somebody to give a personal service online, that seems to be strange. I don't know why that was strange, because that's where your customers are right now, and, and don't, don't rely on a mechanized interface, rely on, on, on your personal service, just like you do in, in, a, in a real world setting. Just because we are talking about challenges, and I'm very aware of the, of the fact that we don't have much time left, and we have to somewhat skim the surface on providing a one-stop shop for um, full e-commerce insight. But um, I really quickly want to touch on, um, and perhaps from each of you, if we're talking about challenges, what solutions have you put in place, operational or otherwise, um, that you think have made a really big difference to your success, um, that you know, somebody here in the audience might be able to take away and kind of learn from themselves? Amber, let's, let's turn to you. Yeah, um, we faced a lot of challenges growing the company, but I think in e-commerce it comes down to conversion and how you can provide the best user experience to check out. Um, we've recently experimented with some gamification features like opening secret levels to secret products after our fan base said that that's what they wanted. But gen like generally, the, the best things are the simplest things. So we recently integrated Amazon Payments, which has been really successful for us in terms of providing an uplift. Um, just because I think our customer base trusts it, it's a secure. So that's been something we've implemented. Yeah. Again, about that idea of trust and security. And yeah, definitely. And Christoph, what about, what about you? I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of lessons that you could share, but can you think of one off the top of your head that yeah. has, has really made a difference? Yeah, maybe to add to Amber's uh, part to, to the conversion, what we, what we had to learn the hard way was that um, we very much focused in the beginning on, on driving conversion, on driving customer acquisition, and doing the branding campaigns like the TV spots we did, which were very successful, but we, we missed out on making sure that also the, the customer experience doesn't end at the conversion, but actually that you have to fulfill operations if you are a retailer and what, what we learned here is that um, we have to align our capacities and what we can actually deliver and also what we do on the marketing and we, we had some I would say some, some months where we struggled in, in overselling what uh, basically over promising our customers and, and then not really were able to, to deliver so what we're now doing is to really align these two two parts that uh, our operational parts working very very closely with the market and country and marketing teams together in order to make sure that in times where maybe the demand is much higher that we also uh, realign marketing and on the other hand as well doing maybe pricing or, or, what, or discount campaigns in a way where we see more potential also in, in terms of um, open resources and capacities in the warehouses. So something where, we, where you really have to align these two ends and not just uh, think in, in silos. And that's, that's what we learned there. I think very important. Reno, quickly to you. I'll be very quick. Um, so we, we learned when we built Depop in the beginning, we, we tried to make everything automated. So we, we wanted to curate the best items and we started curating what your friends like or kind of people that you follow, who do they follow. 
But actually, we ripped it all out and said, let's just, let's just start with humans. So, we, so we've hired people who have an excellent taste to manually curate. And they manually curate the, the best users. They manually curate the best items. I've seen some of Amber's items being picked out because Amber makes an effort when she lists something. And she knows that in order to, to appeal to her customer, this is how it needs to look. And, and we know her as a good seller. So, that's where the human element is, is super important in e-commerce, and it was forgotten for a long time. And I think mobile is, is reviving that realization that actually commerce is very social. That's great, and I think you know, that is a brilliant point to end on. And you know, we've heard a lot this week for other people that have been in the conference about data and deep learning and, and, and AI, and I think um, kind of the overriding message with a lot of it has always been to go back to that idea of the human touch. And I think particularly in our industry where it is creative and where there is that kind of need to really connect with a consumer, it's, it's important to bring that in. Um, I know this has been quite short and hopefully um, you have got something from it. I think we've touched really nicely on ideas like authenticity, on obviously that role of community and localization, and more importantly than all of that, on really, really keeping things simple. Um, I think that's a nice message to, to take away in terms of what works with e-commerce and, and getting those conversions. Um, these guys, I believe, are jetting off, but I'm sure they'll be around quickly afterwards if anybody wants to try and grab them out in the main hall to ask any more questions. But for now, um, I think that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you.